Hey everyone and welcome back to Unit 2 of National 5 Biology, Multicellular Organisms and today we're going on to key area 6 which is transport systems in animals. So most of this key area is going to involve around blood and how blood gets around our system. So we're going to first of all look at the three different types of blood vessel that we can have. So there are arteries and veins which you've probably heard of already but then there are also capillaries. All three of them have a really important function and we're going to have a look at the structural differences between them all as well. So to start off with arteries, in this diagram you can hopefully see that they're quite thick and on the left and right side of the artery they have thick elasticated muscular walls in order to withstand very high pressure. Blood goes through arteries at a very high pressure indeed. Okay, so they need to be able to take that impact. So they've got thick walls and a narrow central channel for blood to get through. Next we have veins. So veins carry blood at a much lower uh, pressure than arteries do. Okay, so because it's not shooting through the vein, they need to have these things called valves to prevent the backflow of blood. If you imagine a valve if you're uh, pumping up a ball, the point of a valve is that you can put the air needle into the ball, you can pump it up, air can go in, but then once you seal it, nothing can come out. It's the same thing with veins. Veins have valves so that blood can go through the, vein, through the valve, but then it can't come back, it can't backflow. Okay, it'd be really, really dangerous. One way I try and remember that veins have valves is just that they both have a V. Veins, valves, valves, veins, that sort of thing. Capillaries though, there's a lot more of these, but they are very small, they're very thin, they're one cell thick, and that's to allow gas exchange, because what capillaries do is they form a network all around our body. If you think you get a paper cut, that's gonna be a capillary that's been damaged, because these tiny little capillaries are all over the place, delivering oxygen, to all the different muscles and tissues that we have all around our body. So next thing I'm going to look at as well is that arteries carry blood away from the heart. So again, our way of remembering this, arteries and away both have an A in them, arteries away, away arteries. It's a good way of thinking about them. So if you have an artery that is carrying blood away from the heart at very high pressure through these thick elasticated walls. Veins, however, carry blood towards the heart, carry it to the heart at a lower pressure, and that's why they have their valves to prevent the backflow of blood. And capillaries, as I was saying before, they have very low blood pressure and they form these networks all around uh, the different muscles and tissues and areas where blood needs to be delivered to. And those one cell thick means that oxygen and carbon dioxide can pass between them. Let's have a look at blood itself. So, Blood is composed of four separate parts, so you've probably heard of red blood cells, probably heard of white blood cells, but you might not have heard about platelets and plasma. So it's made of four separate parts and we need to know what each separate part does. So first of all, red blood cells, you've heard about these before, these are the red part of your blood. The function of a red blood cell is that they are specialised in order to transport oxygen. So remember the whole point really of your blood going around it's the transport oxygen around your body. That's what it's there for. So these red blood cells need to be well designed to transport oxygen. And there's a few things for that. First of all, red blood cells have a protein called hemoglobin. And when hemoglobin binds to oxygen, it produces oxyhemoglobin. And that oxygen can be transported all around by binding to hemoglobin. So try and remember those words there. And that's quite important. Second thing is that they have these strange shapes. So if you look at the top right of the slide just now, they have this sort of strange like donut-like, sort of depressed in the middle shape. And the reason, so first of all, this is called biconcave. If you think of a concave lens when it sort of curves in, biconcave, concave on each side. So a biconcave disc, it maximizes surface area. If you think of the transport and plants key area, root hairs are there to maximize surface area as well. Okay, biconcave discs, maximise the surface area so you can transport as much oxygen as you possibly can. Second of all, these red blood cells have no nucleus, so that means there's even more room for that haemoglobin, which means more room for oxyhemoglobin, which means there's more room for oxygen. And lastly, one of the good things about them is that they're small and they're flexible, so they can squeeze through these capillaries. You do not want them getting stuck anywhere, that would be a clot, that's bad. So you want them to get through all these tiny little capillaries easily, okay, and that's due to their smallness and their flexibility. So that is what makes red blood cells very good at transporting oxygen. 
Next, moving on to white blood cells. So you might have heard before that white blood cells are important for your immune system. They are part of your immune system. So there are two different parts of white blood cells and they're quite important and they're quite tricky. So make sure you go over this quite a few bits. So first of all, white blood cells have phagocytes on them. And what phagocytes do is they engulf and digest pathogens through a process called phagocytosis. So I know there's been a few words thrown at you there. First of all, there are phagocytes. A pathogen is anything that can cause a disease. So any of these little uh, bacteria, these little microorganisms that are there to cause damage to your body, phagocytes find them down, they engulf and digest them. So they basically eat them. So they engulf and digest them. And as they are phagocytes, the process is called phagocytosis. And in doing phagocytosis, they destroy these pathogens, therefore protecting your body. The second thing they have are these things called lymphocytes. And lymphocytes do effectively the same job, they destroy pathogens as well, but instead of going through phagocytosis or engulfing them, what they do is they produce antibodies. And these antibodies go across and destroy pathogens. And it's just a little reminder there that pathogens are disease-causing microorganisms such as bacteria or viruses that can cause any sort of harm to you. Next, we're going to look at platelets. So you've got a lovely little diagram just down at the bottom here. And what that is, is it's going to be a scab. So platelets are there to stop us bleeding out. They're a really important part of our blood and one that people often forget about. So platelets circulate around your blood and they clump together whenever they find any sort of damaged blood vessels. So if you have a cut, for example, platelets are going around your blood and when they find this, they clump together. Once that clot, once that clump of platelets dries out, that becomes a scab. And that's what's there to stop you bleeding and to assist in the healing process. Okay, so the point of platelets is to stop us bleeding. And the final part is plasma. And plasma is very, very important. And what it looks like is this picture on the right here. It's a yellow liquid. So you don't normally think of your blood being a yellow liquid. So that's quite surprising. Plasma is the liquid component of your blood. So as you have your red blood cells that make your blood red, you have a huge amount of this plasma that actually makes it fluid, that makes it a liquid. So this makes up over 50% of your blood and it assists in transporting carbon dioxide, urea, hormones, some digested food products around your body as well. But the main focus on it is for it to become fluid. The point of this, and point of the four different parts of blood that you need to know, is just to get this into your head, like this image here, that it's not just a bunch of red blood cells with some white blood cells thrown in. Okay, you have your red blood cells, you have your white blood cells, you have your platelets and you have your plasma. You need to know what all of them do. Okay, that's the, the main part for your exam. What are they and what is the purpose of them? And maybe give some examples. For example, of red blood cells, why are they good at transporting oxygen around the body? So now that we know about blood, we're going to be looking at the vessel that pumps blood throughout the body. Okay, so we're going to be looking at the heart. So the heart is a bit that people sometimes find quite difficult. So what I really suggest you do is you need to play this back a few times, take some notes on this, hopefully you get a diagram uh, to help you out as well, just because you need to label quite a few structures. And there's going to be quite a few new terms coming towards you. So first of all, what we should already know is the heart is a pump. It's a muscular pump and it pumps blood around the body. So deoxygenated blood is taken to the lungs because deoxygenated blood does not have any oxygen in it. Okay, it needs to pick up oxygen, it needs to refuel with oxygen. So it goes to the lungs to pick up that oxygen. Once that deoxygenated blood has oxygen, it becomes oxygenated, it has oxygen. And then that oxygenated blood is transported around the body so that the rest of the body can get that oxygen. So let's look at how this actually works in the first place. The heart contains four chambers. So if you look at this picture here, there are four sort of separate areas inside the heart. There's the right atrium, the right ventricle, the left atrium, and the left ventricle. Now, what you should probably find a bit confusing right at the start here is that the right side is on the left and the left side is on the right. This is one of the key mistakes that people make in the exam when they're looking at a diagram of the heart. We're imagining that heart as if it is inside your body, as if you're like looking at someone's heart right now. So what we would look at in terms of looking at the right-hand side would actually be their left. What we're looking at as our left-hand side would be their right. Okay, so that's one of the, the key things that trip people up. So just make sure you try and get that head in your head now 
and it'll make the rest of this a lot easier. So if we look at the right of the heart, which is the right atrium, or our left hand side, an atrium is an entrance. So if you look at these top left and top right uh, in this heart structure here, this is where blood is going to come in. And that entrance is called an atrium. Once blood comes into an atrium, it is going to go down below into a ventricle. So the A is blood above the V here, atrium into ventricle, and on the other side as well, atrium into ventricle. So if you remember atrium and ventricle and the order of them, and then you remember your mix up right and left hand sides, you'll know the names of the four chambers. So in order to just we're going to complicate this a little bit now, we're going to look at the blood vessels that work with the heart. Okay, so there could be five here. You're going to know the name of them, you're going to know the location of them, and you're going to need the function of them as well. So again, take your time going through this, play it back if you need to, and make sure you've got some good notes on this. So first of all, this one here is called the vena cava. So hopefully you know this is going into the right atrium. So the vena cava is responsible for bringing deoxygenated blood from the body to the heart. So deoxygenated blood, blood that has went and gave away all its oxygen around the body has now made its way back to the heart. Hopefully you remember if it's coming to the heart, it must be a vein. So the vena cava is a major vein. And this deoxygenated blood needs to come back to the heart to get pumped to the lungs to refuel. So the blood that's been around the body, which is deoxygenated now, comes through the vena cava into the right atrium. Once it goes into the right atrium, it's going to go into the right ventricle. Once it's went from the right ventricle, it's going to get pumped through an artery. And this one here is called the pulmonary artery. So hopefully you can see just from this process where the right atrium, right ventricle, and then sort of up this sort of top right hand structure through this artery. The pulmonary artery takes blood to the lungs. So it's an artery, it's going away from the heart. The blood goes to the lungs through the pulmonary artery. Once the blood has went to the lungs, it's going to pick up oxygen. We're going to look at that, uh, how that occurs in the next key area, so don't worry about it too much just now. But the blood is now oxygenated. It now has oxygen and it's ready to go around the body. So if you imagine this blood has now went around the lungs, it has come back into the heart. So it's going to come into this atrium on the other side, which is the left atrium, through the pulmonary vein. So hopefully that bit's a bit easier. If you think of the lungs, you've got the pulmonary artery goes away from the heart to the lungs, and then from lungs to the heart, it's the pulmonary vein. So that pulmonary vein, vein brings oxygenated blood from the lungs back into the heart. So it goes into the left atrium, into the left ventricle, and then it's going to go out through another artery here. This artery is called the aorta. That's a very, very important part. The aorta pumps that oxygenated blood all around the body. Okay, so the blood comes in to the left atrium for the pulmonary vein, into the left ventricle from um, the left atrium, and then out through the aorta. And that's going to go all around the body. And once that's deoxygenated, once it's used up all its oxygen, delivered it all around the body, it's going to come back in through the vena cava, and the whole process starts again. So I'm going to show you something in a minute that shows this process, maybe a bit easier. But those are the four main blood vessels of the heart. However, I did say we're going to look at five because the blood, uh, the, the heart needs its own blood supply. It needs to be working. If it didn't have its own blood supply, it would not work. So there is another artery called the coronary artery that provides the heart with its own blood supply. This is a very, very different part of the, the course here. You won't see it in a diagram. It would be a question that you would maybe get saying, Oh, this is the heart, this is what's going on, but how does blood, uh, how does the heart get its own blood supply? It's for the coronary artery. Okay, so those are the main blood vessels of the heart. Da uh, use a diagram, get some notes on it, make sure you know what's going on. Just to show this process once more, just to try and get it into your head, okay, I suggest you maybe do this as well at some stage. I'm just going to go through the whole process of blood through, flow through the heart. So, deoxygenated blood that's been around the body is carried into the heart through the vena cava. Once it goes into the vena cava, it goes into the right atrium. From the right atrium, the blood goes into the right ventricle. Once that ventricle is filled up, then the blood is pumped through the pulmonary artery to the lungs. So if you imagine it's went around the lungs now, and it's back into the left atrium. Okay, so the blood comes into the, uh, the heart from the lungs through the pulmonary vein. The left atrium fills up with blood, then goes into the left ventricle, which fills up with blood, and then all this blood gets pumped through the aorta 
to go and deliver oxygen around the body. Now, one thing you might have noticed from the diagram is that the muscular wall on the left or our right of the heart is quite substantially thicker than the, the other side, okay, the right hand side. Now, I want you to think about why that would actually be. Why is it important that this bit, that the left ventricle, is much thicker, that it has more muscle? And the reason for that is because the left ventricle has to pump blood all over the body. Remember, the pulmonary artery sends blood to the lungs. So the artery goes at high pressure and blood goes around the lungs, and that is a, a big job to do, but it's nothing compared to having to pump blood all the way through the body. So that means that the left ventricle has to be much thicker to provide more force for that blood to go all around the body through the aorta. And that is it. That is it for transport in animals. There's a lot there, but make sure you go through the different types of blood, uh, or different components of blood rather, what they are, what they do, why they specialise that way. You then need to be able to know the difference between arteries, veins and capillaries. And once you know your differences between your arteries, veins and capillaries, then apply that to your knowledge of the heart. The veins coming uh, towards the heart, the arteries carrying blood away from the heart, where do they go? Which ones go to the lungs? Which ones go to the body? Where do they then come back in? Okay, so go through these a few times. It's a bit that trips people up. It looks very complicated at the start, but once you start going through that journey of the heart, a few times it'll just get into your head, okay? It'll be very simple. And just remember your left and rights that are opposite this time. Okay, so thanks so much for listening to this, folk. We have one more key area to go.